We're going to record this. We've get, we're getting some shares and people are joining, which is great. And if people have already watched the films and you have any questions, put that in the chat box and we'll cir circle back and um, get to your questions a little later on. So I think we'll get started in just a second. We see more people joining. If anybody wants to share on their own pages or groups that they have, that would be great. Right now it looks like we have at least 11 people. So thank you for joining us. Okay. So tonight we are going to discuss screenagers. Um, my name is Sarah McConnell. And I am Healthy Acadia's Down East Partnerships for Success Coordinator. And with funding from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, we're creating a collaborative effort um, among multiple partners throughout Hancock and Washington counties um, to prevent youth substance use. So Healthy Acadia, and Partnerships for Success um, collaborators are implementing multiple strategies using evidence-based Icelandic model for youth substance prevention, um, which we're tailoring um, to the needs of our communities. Um, we're gonna use these opportunities in Down East Maine to increase our protective factors and decrease our risk factors associated with youth substance use, um, specifically alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And as part of this initiative, um, we're able to provide informational sessions like tonight. Um, and we're really excited to be able to offer free viewings of Screenagers, Growing Up in a Digital Age, and Screenagers Next Chapter, Uncovering Skills um, for Stress Resilience. So tonight we'll be able to talk more about those. Um, don't worry if you haven't watched them yet, they're available until Monday, June 1st, and you can find the links on the panel discussions event page um, or Healthy Acadia's website in our weekly newsletter. Um, I really wish we were together in person this evening, but I'm really excited about the possibility of how many people we're gonna be able to reach in this platform. And now before we begin, let me state the obvious. Um, most of us use technology and screens every day. Here we are tonight. Um, there are many positives in this tech revolution and now more than ever, um, we're benefiting from it. So we're using it to learn. Our children are using it for school. We're using it for work our entertainment and keeping our connections with friends and family. So as we do this during these times, we also wanna be aware of the effects. Um, so we wanna increase the positives and decrease the negatives. And um, remember that it's really important to have an ongoing conversation about screen time and behavioral health. Um, so before we jump in, I want to give a little recap of the films. So Screenagers is about the impact of the digital age on children and how to help them minim minimize harmful effects and find balance. After seeing the film, people say that they feel more confident and better equipped to establish balance around screen time. 
And after viewing um, the next chapter, you can really see how there's a strong correlation between spending time on screens, in particular, social media, and stress, anxiety, and depression, which means they're related. So setting boundaries and focusing on using screens in positive ways is likely to help improve mental well-being. So as we talk this evening, anyone who has questions or comments, please let us know in the comment box and we'll be checking them, um, circling back to get to, to your questions. Um, but now, what we've all been waiting for, um, I really wanna thank all of our panelists for taking the time out of their day um, and days previous getting ready for this. Um, to share their thoughts and resources um, with us all tonight because they're the experts in the field um, and they're living in our communities. So to begin, I would like to introduce Josh Ehrlich, the chairman of Global Leadership Council. Welcome, Josh. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, actually grew up playing the violin. So you might see me playing at open table occasionally if you come to those meals. Um, I spent the last 25 years coaching leaders, and for those not familiar with coaching, basically uses principles of psychology to help professionals set goals and develop their skills to reach career aspirations, typically in professional settings. And I run a network of leadership development experts globally and have a passion for mindfulness and creating mindful leaders in teams and organizations. Uh, and I live in Bar Harbor with my wife and two daughters, Taylor, who's 12, and Skylar, who's five. Oh, thank you, Josh. Uh, now, Kendra Rand of Kendra Rand Communications. Welcome, Kendra. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm Kendra Rand. I teach part-time for the University of Maine Department of Communication and Journalism and also for College of the Atlantic. I primarily teach interpersonal communication, group communication, and public speaking skills. I do some consulting for nonprofit organizations and state and federal agencies in, the, in and around Maine. I'm in Bar Harbor tonight, where I live year round with my family, my wonderful partner, and my two daughters who are in second and fourth grade. Awesome. Thank you, Kendra. Next, we have Dr. Christy Seed from Acadia Integrative Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Seed. Can you please share a little bit more about yourself? Sure. I'm a family physician, also trained in integrative medicine, and currently practice primary care and in integrative medicine here in Somesville, Maine. And I have two children, uh, boys who are 9 and 11 years old, and they uh, both attend Mount Desert Elementary School. And I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, we have Healthy Acadia's Youth Engagement Co Coordinator, Corey Hunkler. Um, thank you for joining us, Corey. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do at Healthy Acadia? Thanks, Sarah. And hi, everyone. Thanks for watching. Um, yeah, I recently came on board at Healthy Acadia as a youth engagement coordinator. Um, really excited about the position and the potential to reach young people across Washington and Hancock counties. And my role focuses on supporting youth engagement programs and initiatives that build resilience and leadership in young people. Um, my panel expertise tonight comes from hearing and talking with young people on their experiences with screens as a school social worker. Um, and I taught digital citizenship in four Washington County schools, pre-K through eight um, previously. And I live in Cherryfield on the borderlands of Washington and Hancock County. Thank you, Corey. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. It looks like we've had over 10 people viewing um, and upwards of about 20 during our time so far. Um, so everyone watching, again, please feel free to send us questions, comment, let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if you know any of us. Um, and hopefully we can shed some light on some different topics tonight. Um, so 
After I watched both films, one of the stats that really stuck out to me was that 53% of teens feel like they're addicted to their mobile devices. Um, and with that, Corey, um, when should I be concerned, become concerned about um, my teen's phone use? Um, how does that relate to anxiety, depression? You wanna share anything on that? I, I really wish there was a easy measure to determine when you should be concerned, but I'm not really sure there is one. I think that as a parent or a guardian, you know your teen the best and, or your young person the best. Um, and I think after you make a decision to allow your child or young teen to have their phone, it's kind of up to you to be able to monitor their use and kind of have ongoing, non-judgmental, open conversations with them about what's going on. You know, you always want to look at with any behaviors in teens, if there's like a change in their temperament, like being withdrawn or lack of sleep or grades dropping or in, uh, loss of interest in social activities or kind of being very preoccupied with the phone or struggling to go without it. Like, you know, these are all examples of things you might be like, oh, little red flag. Maybe I want to talk to them um, and check in with them about their use. Um, and, you know, relating to anxiety and depression is also pretty complex <laughs> and, you know, multifaceted, um, you know, how, like about mental health diagnoses and how they're related to screens and how they develop. Um, but from experience, what I've seen in teens is screens are a great way, teens and adults, screens are a great way to distract yourself from the problems that exist in the real world. Um, and so a lot of times by retreating into a screen, every time you feel sad or anxious or lonely or nervous, you're not allowing yourself to kind of be present in the world and develop kind of skills to deal with these emotions. Um, when I was in the classroom educating, um, about screens, young children often point out how upset they get because they feel ignored when their parents are using screens. And this is before usually they have their own screens. So I think that's a really important thing to be aware of too, is how we're modeling it. And the last point is kind of a lot of young tweens and teens. Let me know that social media contributes to their feeling of low self-worth when they're scrolling through airbrush photos, edited photos, beautiful people, groups of people having fun for hours on end can really distort your perception or their perception of themselves at such a delicate time of growth. Um, yeah, based on research, common sense media, published statistics that after like 45 minutes of use on Instagram, Snapchat, or TikTok, your emotions actually start to decline and you're no longer having fun. So you mentioned you um, worked in schools. What are um, some of the barriers that exist for teens and those students to um, discuss their mental health issues? I think, uh, well, developmentally during the teenage years, um, teens have the desire, you know, middle school teens, you have the desire to belong and fit in with your peers. You're also kind of breaking away from your parents and trying to form your own identities. Um, and mental health carries a stigma that can be negative. And so I think it's hard for teens to kind of break away from their peer groups and reach out for help, especially if that's not the norm. Um, I loved in the film, I love the peer support group. And I think things like this and mentoring programs are proven really successful models to support help because it reduces that stigma and they're also learning from each other. Um, also most interventions done from adults are in a lecture or teaching format or, well, when I was your age. And really in teens, the most effective way to create change is to find ways that motivate young people by offering opportunities for choice and input and like having conversations and helping them kind of paint their desires and their future. Um, and this is done by research. David Yeager, who is featured on the second film briefly, um, has done a lot of studies on what motivates teens to change behavior and reach out. Great, thank you, Corey. Um, Kendra, would you like to touch on the uh, observations about anxiety and stress management um, for college level students? Sure, I'm happy to. And that was, Corey, that was so insightful to hear from you, you know, these observations, because I'm interested tonight in learning how some of 
the you know tools and strategies that we get from the film that we hear from each other tonight can apply across a, a wide variety of, of age groups you know ourselves included just from my own experiences teaching in more than 20 years now it's anecdotal evidence but i've definitely seen an increase in students who communicate explicitly with me about their experiences with anxiety and mental health issues sometimes I wonder if that's because of the nature of the class content, but um, it's also possibly in part because we're just more culturally aware, uh, more aware of the subject and that universities and colleges are making important resources more available to students. Uh, I recommend a book that came out last year. It's called The Stressed Years of Their Lives, Helping Your Kids Survive and Thrive During the College Years by Drs. B. Janet Hibbs and Anthony Rustain. They, in this book, they report that the need for mental health services on college campuses really started to boom in the late 90s. I found that statistic interesting because I find myself in that demographic, and I wonder if a lot of present-day parents would identify with being in that demographic of having started college in the late 90s. They go on to add, though, that by the mid-2000s, mental health task forces were, were cropping up all around college campuses across the country. And then additionally, in the past few years, they report a 30% increase in students seeking counseling services on campus. Um, part of that includes some positive trends, which is that more students are now attending college from a much wider variety of backgrounds, which is wonderful, and also bringing um, you know, a wider variety of needs, which is important. And uh, they also add that there are better resources on campuses and less stigmatization around these issues. Um, but there's no question in my mind that the same concerns that the teens in the film and the teens and adolescents in our lives, um, you know, are, uh, the way they're manifesting these, you know, challenging issues, that the same manifestations relate to present day college students. So we can think about how these relate to the young adult who's about to enter college or has just recently entered college. So that's partly why I'm really excited to hear from everyone tonight, just to see how these ideas and strategies relate among all kinds of youth. And then one other thing, actually, that I just thought of, it's, it's a lot harder to do social science research on kids and teenagers. It's much easier to do social science research on college freshmen. They're technically adults. And so there's a trove of data around, you know, these kinds of trends, specifically the relation, you know, connection between feelings of reported isolation and loneliness and anxiety, along with social media use. So there is a trove of data out there about, you know, young adults, college age adults, that I think is really valuable for those of us who are interested in how this applies to arming our kids with skills and resources as they become young adults. That's very interesting, Kendra, thank you. Um, Josh, would you like to talk about strategies to manage anxiety and how we can build emotional intelligence? Sure. Those are huge topics. So I'll just give a little bit of kind of my top tips, if you will. Um, you know, my favorite in terms of anxiety is practicing mindfulness, which essentially means being present. And it doesn't mean meditational. That's one way to practice mindfulness. It basically means what's going on right now. Can I be open to that and interested in that? And a great way to do that is by just connecting with your body, being in touch with your breath is an amazing way to come back to this moment. Because what happens when we're anxious is we're jumping into the future typically and telling negative stories and fantasies about what catastrophe is about to happen. Or we're ruminating about the past and falling into a negative spiral about what we should have or could have done. So coming back to this moment, what's happening right here and how I'm feeling right now is a great way to get out of that. And just noticing and you can do this as you're listening now, just noticing your breath, particularly at your belly. Are you breathing kind of shallow and up here or down deep in, in your belly? And just noticing that resets your breath and brings you back to the present. And so I love the film's um, strategy. They talk about the three X's. Right? The first X is to expect anxiety. And actually, I think it's really more about accepting anxiety. You know, that anxiety will happen. It's not, so we get ourselves wrapped up when we start to say, well, I shouldn't be feeling anxious. Oh, no, I'm feeling anxious. We get this negative spiral there, too. The first thing is just to accept that it is there. The second X is to externalize, to name it, to label it, to, to say, you know, one of my favorite authors is Thich Nhat Hanh. He talks about saying, hello, my little friend, you know, my, my fear. And as, you, as it comes up, you, you don't 
you know, don't squash it, you don't suppress it. You say, oh, you recognize it and you contain it within your awareness. So you're getting it out of it occupying you to saying, okay, it's over there. It's somebody else, something else. That's the externalized. And the third X is experiment, which is to test your reality. Don't just avoid the fear, but go after it. You know, get into that situation and realize you can, can get through it. But I think there's a fourth X, you know, I love the, you know, a good acronym is worth millions, but the fourth X for me is exhale. So mm -hmm. especially focusing on our exhalation helps us calm down. When you focus on the inhalation, we tend to rev ourselves up. So exhaling is a beautiful thing. And we can talk more about emotional intelligence, but that's kind of a bite size around anxiety management. Thank you. We definitely all could use that and be reminded of that. I know I could multiple times a day. Um, Dr. Seed, Screenagers touches on brain development. And can you speak about the physiological changes that occur um, in teen brains? Absolutely. And I think, Josh, what you just spoke about, it's a perfect segue into talking about some of the anatomic changes that occur in the teenage brain and all of our brains when we are at uh, viewing screens on a large basis. They talk in the movie about the amygdala. The amygdala is a very small part of the brain in the center of the brain and it's where our fight or flight, where our fear, where our anxiety kind of is born. It's the place that is really important when we were cave men and women and we were being chased by a wildebeest or some other type of large predator, the amygdala would kick in and it'd say, okay, and essentially shut down the rest of the brain so that all we were focused on was the fear and we would run away and hopefully escape. Unfortunately, what we're living in these days with lots of screen, with the anxiety, with media is our amygdala is firing all of the time. And so, Joss, what you're talking about with um, mindfulness, they've actually done studies where if we take that time to breathe in, to breathe out, that we actually can change the size of our amygdala. We can shrink it and therefore it's less active. And then the higher portion of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, the area where we make our best decisions, that can actually work. I found a really interesting study not too long ago, and it was talking about how in teenagers, the amygdala actually grows faster than the higher portions of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is where we have all our emotions. So it teens are just primed on a physiologic level to have all of these emotions and not to the higher cortex to be able to regulate that, to say, hey, this is anxiety I'm dealing with. It just is overpowered by that amygdala. And they talk in Screenagers, the next chapter, about how when we're born, we have all these neurons just growing, growing, growing. And once we get into our teenage years, the neurons are starting to be pruned. So the pathways that are being used the most are the pathways that are going to stay. The pathways that aren't being used are the pathways that are going to be uh, downregulated or they're gonna be pruned away. And so if teens are spending most of their time in a stressful situation or in a situation such as being on a phone where they're getting that instant gratification from, Bing after bing after ping, or like after like after like, those are the pathways that are becoming the super highways in their brain. Those are the pathways that are getting formed. And if it's a stress or anxiety pathway, that's where the teen's gonna go, the teenage brain, as opposed to a teenage brain who's having social interactions in a positive, actual in-person situation or a team sport or some other extracurricular that's those are the pathways that will get really turned into the super highways so the teenage brain is just so susceptible to what influences are occurring at that time if there's a lot of stress that amygdala is going to grow those higher cortexes aren't going to get the super highways going to them instead they're going to get kind of into these patterns of anxiety and primed for the rest of their lives to be in those places. So I found that portion of the film to be really helpful to just understand how important this is 
for us to help our teens understand you're creating neuronal pathways, not for just now, but for the rest of your life. Yeah, and so our brains are plastic, which is kind of a strange phrase, but it means we can mold them and the activities, mm -hmm. the things that we do change our brain structure, right? So the other amazing thing from the research is that multitasking, which screens encourage us to be doing two things at once, is actually neurotoxic, mm -hmm. and especially neurotoxic to the prefrontal cortex, right? So I'm a, I'm a kind of recovering neuroscientist, so I love this stuff, but this area of your brain will thin, and mm -hmm. you need that area of your brain to focus here and not there, to filter out distractions. And so when we chronically are using multiple screens and checking email and interrupting ourselves, we actually lose the ability to focus and be present, Whereas conversely, when we practice being present and mindful, this area of the brain actually thickens. So it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing, Christy, you're absolutely right, that the, the brain aspects of that can really help us realize the power of this. Yes, I find talking to my patients who are teenagers, it's just a different avenue to approach. It's not you're bad because you're on social media, but you're actually just as if you go to the gym and you exercise, your body's going to respond in a way that your muscles are going to grow, your heart's going to be healthy. Talking about it on that physiologic level, at least for me, I feel like takes away the judgment of screen times bad because but rather this is the physiological effects that having screen time increasing anxiety is going to have on you just a different avenue to approach with teens tweens all of us yeah and you're bringing up something else which i think somebody at healthy acadia said to me and i, I love this phrase said be aware of screen shaming mm -hmm. right and so you know we get into this conversation and talk all about the negativity screens and <clears throat> sarah you're good to start us off with positive aspects of screens. There's so much positive there too. But we can shame ourselves and shame each other about screen time use. And we have to be careful about that. You know, it's about overuse. It's not about never using. It's not about never multitasking. It's just about, okay, just be conscious of what you're doing and how often what mm -hmm. that's doing to you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for um, bringing that higher level um, thinking into a more um, general way of us understanding. Um, that was really great. Um, Kendra, uh, can you talk about the value of practicing interpersonal communication? Oh, sure. And, you know, Christy, I wondered what you thought of this particular line in the film. It's, it's been so rich to hear what everybody's favorite moments or the, the certain moments that popped out for each of us. But um, you know, the, the one line that the filmmaker Delaney Russin says, um, she says, my favorite mentor in medical school said that while a surgeon has her scalpel, a primary care physician has her, has her words. And she goes on to say, it's all about practicing to be better at using words to help. What if so much of what we call stigma about mental health problems is actually unease and fear around talking with someone going through emotional challenges? What if we promoted a lot more practice in these and other authentic conversations early on? And as someone who believes so passionately, passionately in this kind of work, in this kind of study, you can imagine that that really spoke to me. So I guess I'm gonna make an analogy that I welcome Josh to provide feedback on here because I think we think about our interpersonal communication the same way that we think about our breathing in that we don't think about it very much. <laughs> we take these things for granted because we do them all the time. They seem second nature. It just seems like, you know, it's not something that we would, you know, prioritize. But um, just as it's incredibly valuable to practice deep, conscious, mindful breathing, I would argue it's also equally valuable to practice deliberate, thoughtful, interpersonal communication. And to have the opportunity to learn from educators and mentors and how to do this and how to practice it is extremely valuable. So even if we take for granted, just like breathing, we take for granted that it's intuitive, it's natural, having someone in our lives to literally coach us and be someone who's willing to practice with us is just so invaluable. And then of course my favorite part is when the, the I think she's like the high school freshman, Vanessa, she's guiding some middle schoolers through a conversation in a library setting. To me, that was just one of the richest parts of the film to see that peer mentorship that I heard Corey talk about too. It, you know, it's, so, it's proven to be such a valuable tool, but also it just, it made so much sense. 
And then, you know, going one step further, I think that actually engaging in that sort of deliberative kind of interpersonal communication practice, even if it doesn't seem intuitive and it seems hard, you know, it's something we can model for our kids. It's something we can do for each other as spouses and family members and colleagues to really demonstrate mindful listening, uh, you know, engaging with each other empathically, being able to quiet our minds and not be distracted, but really truly listen to each other. And then what that can do is it can lead, the, lead us to those three X's or the four that you described, Josh, which I really appreciated. We, in that ability to practice with someone we trust, to practice these hard interpersonal communication experiences, we can expect the emotions that go with that. We can externalize and name them as the film describes. And then that in and of itself is the experimenting. We're trying out how to do these things and how they might go. And just as a final thought to that, I think one of the best insights from the film was when they said that, you know, these lectures about bullying really need to stop. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of wonderful resources in our school district and other school districts really bringing in great ideas to this, but really acknowledging for kids just how challenging and socially complex those kinds of interpersonal communication can be but then also following it up with tools and resources and examples of how to do them well and encouragement to literally practice it. Just like we would encourage um, practicing mindful breathing, practicing an instrument, practicing a sport. It's really valuable to be practicing these kinds of skills too. Yeah, I love that idea, Kendra, of being intentional about the practice. And just to give a quick one, which you, you teach and know about Kendra, but partners, spouses, anybody on the, on the call tonight or with your children, you can practice what's called speaker listener. Yeah. Essentially, that means you get three minutes, you speak, the other person listens, and they just tell you what they heard at the end of three minutes. Just pure and simple, and then you switch places. And I teach this with leaders all the time. It's incredible how little we get listened to in a really fresh and deep and intentional way. So it's amazing to practice it, as I say, Kendra, I love that, you know, thinking about it, just instead of taking it for granted, let's practice some listening and speaking with each other. I'm always surprised at how challenging that practice is, Josh, both to sit and listen and not feedback and be thinking about, well, how am I going to respond? And also sometimes to just share for three minutes without somebody jumping in, you know, like, okay. <laughs> but I think it's a wonderful practice. And we saw John and Julie Gottman in the movie and I'm just, you know, they're an amazing example of a couple, you know, late in life that still works on the relationship and they keep writing books. Um, there's, there's one that I'm reading with my wife called The Eight Dates, which is all about enriching your relationship. But you know, they're in their 80s and 90s and just still working on the relationship and can model speaker listener in the film. So it was really, really neat to see. So um, Josh or any, I want all of you to answer this um, if you would like. Um, can you tell us about the strategies that you use in your homes to help minimize screen time? Um, maybe touch on how you've tried to adapt this thinking now that we are in these times where most of us are on our screens even more um, than ever. Anyone want to? Sure, jump? I'll comment on it. Um, I always say school work is not included in screen time. The, the non-optional screen time is something we all are you know, subject to, but I've actually found it interesting as we've been on screens more for requirements. My children have been finding they don't wanna be on as much, which is somewhat refreshing. It also coincides with the weather becoming beautiful. So I don't know which one's which, but, um, in order to enforce, we have iPads and I love the screen time um, limits that can be set because prior to setting those limits, we've had discussions of how much time do you think is appropriate with the, our children. And so that it's a discussion, not a absolute, not me coming down and my husband coming down saying, this is it. Um, and then setting those limits on the iPad, so there's no discussion. It's It makes it easy, I think, in that um, they just turn off when their 15 minutes during the school week is done. And at one point, my oldest, who was, was 10 at the time, he said, but mommy, don't you trust me? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, 
I don't trust you because I don't really trust myself. I put my own screen time limits on my iPhone because I find it's such a slippery slope. And when he heard me say that, he was like, oh, okay, this isn't me. This isn't just because I'm a kid and I don't have self-control or regulation. This is a you know universal problem. And I really think it is. It's not just children that I'm talking to as patients about screen time. It's all ages. And so I think for kids to hear, this isn't just you. It's not because you're just a kid. It's all of us. Yeah. Hi, my name is Josh and I'm a screenaholic. <laughs> uh -huh. First step, right? <laughs> we're, we're all addicts. And if we don't admit it, we're fooling ourselves. Yeah. I felt guilty during the screenagers, the next generation, when they were talking about the screen in the bedroom. <laughs> Just guilty. <laughs> I, in my work in schools with a lot of kids, um, I found that um, a lot of kids, the screen was a babysitter for them, whether their parents are working full their time, whether they're busy with younger siblings, whether they're just not able to be present from whatever reason. Um, and so I really felt like my, it was my job as an educator to help support kids to set their own boundaries and limits around screens. Um, even now with schooling online, I would hope that educators are out having these conversations with young people um, because kids know, kids can identify you know, after four hours of video games, how did you feel? Oh, I feel tired, zonked out, lonely, you know, like, um, and so then it's like taking that conversation and saying, hey, like, do you want to talk about ways that you can maybe get better sleep? And so a lot of times I'm working with kids to give them their own skills for self-care because I never assume that there's somebody at home that's able to set those limits, whether they have their own screen time struggles or whatever. Um, I think the best thing we can do as educators is equip youth with the skills to be able to kind of be mindful about their own screen time. Thank you, Corey. I think there's also the engagement and invitation to do something else. I think it was one of you actually on this panel, I can't remember who said this, but you know, it's not about screen time use, it's about what are you not doing because you're doing the screen. So, you know, our house of trying to get everybody outdoors as much as possible, I think that's an amazing way to come back to our senses and wake up. Um, being in natural settings is incredibly important and healthy for us. It reduces symptoms of attention deficit that, you know, screens tend to ratchet up those symptoms. Being outdoors in nature reduces them. So you can talk about, you know, attention deficit or you can talk about nature deficit. And we all around here, we have access if we make the intention and go and do it. But there's other creative activities when it's not nice out, you know, we're doing a lot more cooking, gardening now with what I swear that you know, we're doing tie dyeing recently. So it's the invitation to do something else. And it just, it takes our time and energy, me and Lisa to, to do that. You know, so that's the, the trouble is, you know, that, that's a potentially limited resource. So I think again, it's okay to do screens too. When we've done them, we've tried to curate and pick movies that will be interesting, like the screen ages we watched as a family and some really interesting movies like um, the Green Powerhouse, which you can find on, on Facebook. Amazing stuff and, and the kids are loving learning about all sorts of things, there's TED Talks. So there's great content. You don't have to just avoid screens, you can make better content as well. Great. Um, how can we mobilize teachers and parents and kids in our community to keep this conversation going, um, especially during these times? I really want to plug when I was transitioning out of my role in the schools, the number one thing teachers wanted that I was delivering was the digital citizenship curriculum. And I really want to plug common sense media um, as a tool and a resource for educators to continue these conversations in their classrooms for parents to pick appropriate movies and kind of set their own limits with children. Um, there's an actual curriculum for pre K through grade 12 that is an actual standards-based tied-in curriculum that teachers can use in their classroom. Um, and I think it's a really, I think it's an awesome, wonderful resource. Yeah, it's something I really hoping we can get out of this is uh, can continue in conversation. There's lots of people in the community that I've been talking to since the first Screen Ages we filmed, you know, at the Jessup and at the high school, there's been so many people who are concerned and want to keep talking about it. It's not clear to me what the forum is, but there's a lot of parents who are 
very passionate about this topic and a lot of teachers as well. And so somehow I think it'd be helpful if we can have a forum to keep talking about it. Maybe Healthy Acadia can help us bring that group together. But it's, it's something we need to keep, I think basically have the conversation keeping being alive, you know, as opposed to we just kind of go back and, and get into our addictive, you know, wired into the matrix uh, mode. So. So we, um, we've had some people comment, which is great. Great to see that people are um, watching and listening in. Um, Donna Mitchell um, wants to thank you guys for speaking of about the time that we must spend on our screen, um, which again, now more than ever, I feel like I'm on my computer, um, as many people are. And Jen wants to thank everyone for hosting and viewing. So thank you, Jen, for listening in with us. And if anybody else has any questions, um, we would love to hear from you. I know it, uh, even though you are behind that screen, it can be intimidating to even ask a question. Um, and while we're waiting, we, you asked me about cultivating emotional intelligence and I didn't answer you. Um, is it want to? Grab on, but um, I think it's a it's a huge topic, and and I teach a lot of this. The first step for me is to manage stress, because when we're stressed and raw, we're at our worst, right? So, the first thing to do is self care, cultivate resilience, take care of yourself. It's important all the time, but even more during COVID, is we need to take care of ourselves. So sleep, exercise, diet, the pillars, right? Once we can do that our emotional intelligence naturally goes up, right? So we cultivate mindfulness, our intelligence goes up even more, which, what, what does that look like? That means naming and labeling our feelings. Just noticing physically, a lot of our emotions we feel physically. So just feeling what it is, right? Sense it first, then label it, give it a name. What am I feeling? And then share it. So you could call that the three S's. I'm riffing on the three X's, now we have the three S's, right? So sense it, sign it or label it, and then share it. That's my tips for emotional intelligence. Thanks, Josh. If I could add to that, um, so Josh, that's such a, these are all such important reminders. And um, I, thanks to the internet and, <laughs> and all the resources out there, I've come across a couple wonderful articles recently, a couple blog posts by Esther Perel. She's a long time uh, psychotherapist and just a, just a wealth of important information. And um, I have a little resource sheet that I've shared with, I think Sarah, you have access to that or there might be a way to share that, but she has some wonderful blog posts in the last few weeks that really speak to exactly what we're talking about here too, but very specifically in a time of the stress and anxiety associated with living in quarantine situations and living in just a very uncertain time, especially when there's a lot more togetherness. It's, you know, it's ironic that we were thinking about the perils of our screen sort of pulling us apart from each other. And now we have all this time together in our homes. And how do we navigate some of the news, you know, interpersonal friction that can go with that. And she's just a wonderful thinker on this subject. And I really encourage anyone to review some of those articles and suggestions too. Great. So we did have, um, Jen was wondering if we have any tips, um, can continue the conversation on mindfulness um, with families. She said the kids are doing it in school, which is wonderful, but I'd love to continue it at home with parent education. Does anybody have any insight on that? Gosh, I don't have a lot, but I would give a shout out to Connors Emerson Elementary School because I know for a fact that several of their um, their educators have been on my daughter's online, you know, morning meetings and have continued a lot of the wonderful work they've been doing in their live classes too. So I echo Jen's question and sentiments for more, but I do know that several educators have already been doing a remarkable job. And of course, I would love more as well. Yeah. One way that we practice at home is um, yoga before bed. And kids love yoga because you can have a lot of animal postures and moves and it's a great way to kind of settle down before going to sleep and so um there's lots online you can look at different poses and so on but you can just also sit on the floor back to back is a wonderful exercise and feel each other breathing so just sit squat legged on the floor 
with your child sitting back to back. Just feel yourself and your child breathing. It's a wonderful way to settle down, just having a moment to do that. I, I also mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh before. He's got some great um, practices. One, one that I love is called the breathing room, which is his idea that each house should have not just you know, kitchen and dining area, but a room where you can go if there's a fight or you need to calm down, you just go there to breathe. In our family, we often just do really small snippets. So before a meal, we'll just have a moment of silence. Come on over. <laughs> this is Brendan. So just it, we'll sit and before anybody eats, we'll take a moment of silence. Or if we're taking a hike in the woods, we'll say, hey, let's just all be quiet for a moment. And let's, what do you hear? Or let's just sit for a moment and what do we see? Just really focusing on one sense. And I found the very brief one minute here, one minute there often is much more effective than trying to do a big yoga routine or something else more involved. So that's one of our approaches. It's great. It is great. So as we come to an end of our conversation, um, if any of you could provide everyone with one key takeaway from the films um, and also any resources that you have and we can try to link them up um, in the newsfeed or on our Facebook page and web page later as well. Um, so any key takeaway messages and then resources, contact information, anything that you want to make sure people know. Corey, do you want to? Sure. Um, I was thinking mindfulness makes you feel when you're feeling present and there's nothing more present than engaged in play with kids. Um, and I, that's part of why I love working with kids is kids are very present and here um, and it's really good to be around um, and I, I I liked the watching Delaney the director's journey in the film and her own realization about how to address these issues and really coming from a place of a conversation and not a reaction and not a lecture and not a lesson um, and I like to watch her go through it and realize it with her own daughter because I think that's important, especially as a parent when we're worried or angry, you know, you're reacting from that place instead of being open um, and allowing your younger person to come from where they are. Um, I also want to add that I'm really excited about this position, my position at Healthy Acadia um, as a youth engagement coordinator because my position allows me to support this work, especially if it's driven by young people, if they're interested in changing their cell phone policies or they're interested in having more conversations around media or education or interested in doing peer support groups at their school um, that's something that i am able to support and help get started um, so feel free to reach out to me if anybody is interested or educators want to know more about common sense or curriculum common sense media not just common sense um, yeah my email is corey.hunkler at healthyacadia.org and thank you so much sarah for hosting and everyone for participating i feel like i learned a lot too um, in this conversation um, so i appreciate that's great, Corey. I, I love that you want to do more with the social emotional groups in schools because I think that was my biggest inspiration from the film was watching those kids talk with each other in a real mature way, the, the boys and the girls. I'd love to have that happen more in, in our schools here in, on the island. Um, so I've been in touch with, with some people, Edie, um, maybe on the, on the call tonight and others. So hopefully we can get that going with your help. That'd be That'd be great. My big takeaway from the films was actually the optimism, right? So we're talking a lot about the negativity side of it, but I found Delaney was incredibly optimistic about the social and emotional development that kids are um, tapping into now. And the reality is that we've always avoided our feelings in different ways before screens, right? We used sports and alcohol and drugs, right? And now we use screens, but the positive shifts that kids are starting to de demonstrate uh, in schools and, and using some of the things like the groups is just wonderful to watch. So it's not all a negative story. That was my big takeaway. My takeaway was just that this is such a common experience, so it, particularly in the next screen the next chapter, the idea just that 
anxiety, depression, mental health issues are such a significant, they're just so significant in so much of the population. And I think a lot of times teens and kids feel isolated in those feelings. And so to know they're not alone and they can share that not only with other teachers or adults, but also with uh, their peers, I think is huge. I think a lot of times people feel, feel very isolated and that they're the only ones experiencing this. It's been so great to hear everyone's, you know, takeaways, because I agree with you all. And, and certainly building a little bit on, Corey, what you were talking about, I think in both films, one of the most valuable parts is that uh, the filmmaker Delaney Rustin is very candid about her own journey and figuring this stuff out too. And, one of her quotes that jumped out at me when I watched this time was tolerate as, as a parent, as a mother, she says, tolerating our own emotions when we have to enforce boundaries with our kids is a hard thing to do. And so just the skills that we're trying to impart on our kids are just as relevant to us as we're doing that exact job. So in addition to all those wonderful scenes of the peer educators and the, you know, the, the peer coaching around mental health, around suicide awareness, around interpersonal communication strategies, in addition to those, I think just for the second time, being her own sort of very candid um, experiences as a mom in a very challenging, you know, for a very challenging subject matter in a very challenging time was really refreshing and also really encouraging and motivating. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so we did have another question come in. Um, so Sue would like to know if there's a financial need to support these efforts. So I can speak to Healthy Acadia's um, financial needs. We definitely have um, a number of employees in place in Hancock and Washington counties. Um, some of our funding is limited to the area that we can serve. Um, Right now, a lot of um, our resilience work is being done in Hancock County, um, and we would like to expand that. And um, I'll give another shout out to um, Downey's Teen Leadership Camp can always use support to support our teens um, with some summer um, experiences. And um, with Corey's help, we'll expand that work into um, the full year. So is there anyone else that has any thoughts on that? I think we, um, we're always looking um, for new ways and new funding to um, help with these topics and resilience and mindfulness is definitely um, in the forefront these days. So it's definitely always good when we can have um, more support with those. Um, does anyone have any last thoughts? Thank you guys. Um, can't thank you enough for being with us tonight. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who was tuning in. Um, we are recording this and it's also, will be available on our Facebook page. Um, so we can, I can look back and get some of those great, um, informational tidbits as I wasn't able to fully <laughs> listen in as uh, we're on this digital platform as we spoke to earlier. Um, but if anyone has any questions um, after they see this, you can um, let us know. My email is sarah, S-A-R-A, at healthyacadia.org. And we have a great weekly newsletter um, and our Facebook page and website is um, updated frequently. And we are now using our YouTube channel more. So hopefully we can get this video up on our YouTube as well. Um, so with that, that's what we have for you guys this evening. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm happy to connect with people on Facebook and LinkedIn. I have also a website that has some resources as well. So we can distribute those. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kendra. Christy, Corey, great to be Likewise. with you. Likewise, it was so nice to learn from you all tonight. Thank you, Sarah, for being a part of this and making this happen. I can't thank you, thank you guys enough. It, it is uh, beyond what I had expected. Um, so with that, I wanna please everyone just be safe and be well and 
maybe we'll have another forum like this again. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.